Caching is hard. If you've been around in software for long enough, you've probably heard someone say this. So in this video, we're going to go over four actual applications of caching, starting with browser caching. Let's take a look over here. On my screen right now, I've got Wikipedia open to the article on JavaScript. Now, if I open up the developer tools and I go to the network tab here, and now I'm on my Mac, so I'm going to hit Command Shift R, and this will perform a non-cached refresh of the page. So we can see here a list of all the assets that our browser requested. We can see there's several images in here, some PHP files, some JavaScript. So if we look at the bottom here, we can see that in total, 358 kilobytes was transferred over the wire in order to load this page. Now here I'm going to hit Command R, and this is going to perform a cache full refresh of the page. In this case, we can see only 831 bytes were transferred, which is really quite little compared to the amount of kilobytes we were transferring originally. If we look at the list of files here, we'll notice that they're actually the same files that we requested originally, only this time the majority of them were pulled from cache as opposed to actually going over the wire. So browser caching here sped up the user experience significantly and also drastically reduced the amount of data that had to be transferred over the wire in order for us to see this article. Let's go through this process step by step so we can figure out what exactly caching is doing. I have here my browser and we can see that we're trying to get to mysite.com. So once I've entered this URL into my browser, my browser is going to send a request to the server at mysite.com and look for the index.html file. The server is then going to respond with that file. But while that's happening, we're actually going to also come store this index.html file inside of our browser cache, as we can see here. Now the purpose of this is if we ever need to request the specific file again, we'll have a version of it stored on our disk so that we don't actually have to make a network request in order to fetch it. Now while we're unpacking this HTML file, we might notice there's an image tag that's pointing to the zac.png file on the MySite server. So after we get the HTML file, our browser is going to then do a request for that image and our server will then respond with that image. And this way we'll be able to see the zac.png inside of our browser. But just like we did with the image.html file, we'll see that the browser is also going to come in and cache this image file inside of the browser cache as well. This way, if we ever need to pull this image again, even if it's on a different page of our website, we'll be able to just pull it from cache and we won't need to make another network request in order to retrieve it. This idea of populating the cache is also sometimes referred to as warming the cache. If we were to reset the graph now, but keep our warmed browser cache, we'll see that the way this will work is our browser is actually going to know that we have this HTML file stored in our cache already. So rather than ne make a network request, we'll simply pull this file from the browser cache. Now we'll still notice the same image tag as before. So now our browser is going to request that image tag and notice it's in the cache as well. And this will come back onto our browser. And now we have our beautiful website. Now notice we didn't actually make any network requests here. Everything happened on the left-hand side of the graph, which shows how powerful caching is, but it also kind of demonstrates some of the issues here. For example, since there's no connection to the server, the server could have easily replaced the old index.html file with a new index.html file, and we would be oblivious to it because we just pulled everything from cache. So part of this element of caching being hard is coming from this idea of having to invalidate that cache so that our browser doesn't always show stale information because it happened to live in the cache. By default, any item stored in the browser's cache is going to have a TTL or time to life, which will essentially ensure that nothing is going to stay in the browser's cache for too long. There's also specific headers we can use on the server side to specify a specific resource as being no cache. And this will signal to the browser that it shouldn't cache the specific file. Now we can take those same principles that we see at the browser level and now we're going to apply them at the application level. The main difference here is that rather than caching files, we're now caching data and rather than storing these files to disk, we're storing this data in our application's memory. And obviously we'll need to implement in JavaScript the caching logic. And this is where things can get really hard, but thankfully this is where TanStack Query, formerly known as React Query, can really shine. The code that I have on screen here really exemplifies the beauty of this library's API. We can see here I'm creating a custom hook to get a list of to-do items. If we look at my code here, we can see that there's really just these five very simple lines where we're telling the library, here's a key to store our data. Here's a function that's going to define how to get that data. If we take a peek here, we can see we're actually going to be performing a network request and then return an array of this to do object. And we're also specifying here a stale time, which is signifying to the library how long to treat this data as fresh before marking it as stale. And really the library is going to handle all of that caching logic for us while still giving us control 
control over the cache so we can still manually invalidate certain pieces of the cache when it's appropriate to do so. Here's that same to-do list, but now I'm looking at it via a browser. Because I'm using TanStack and I'm in developer mode, I actually have this tooling available to me so I can visualize what's going on with my cache. We can see here's that to-dos item of my cache, and if we click into it, we can see that it's currently stale because we've already passed the 10 seconds that was specified. And when we get to the data explorer, we can actually see each one of the to-do items that exists inside of our array. Now, as we can see, I'm not just simply displaying these to-do items. I can also edit them or delete them or add a new one. So here, if I add a new item to my list, when I hit enter, I'm actually making a round trip here to send my new to-do item to my backend API. And then I'm actually invalidating my prior query to signal to the TAN stack query library that it needs to refetch the to-do list. Let's take a look at the code again. Here's the code for the form to add a new item to our to-do list. If we scroll down a bit, we can see here the forms on submit is pointing to this handle submit function. And this function is essentially wrapping this mutate function that we can see defined right here. That's going to describe how to signal to our backend API that we want to add a new to-do item. But then if we look at this on settle function that's provided as well, TanStack query is going to use this as a hook so that once our mutation is settled, we're then going to invalidate the to-dos item of our cache. So essentially, once the mutation to add a new to-do item to our backend has completed, we can then simply invalidate the to-do list and TanStack query is going to go and refetch that data for us without us having to think about it. Again, this shows how powerful caching can be in terms of constructing an application now. We're now essentially using TanStack query as a data layer for our application. And we're going to need to make sure that the logic we're using to interact with that layer is correct. Or else we could get some weird bugs here that might be kind of hard to debug. So far, we've been looking at caching in respects to data that we expect to change over time. For example, browser caching, we expect the website to eventually get updated. And in our React query example, we expected our to-do list to change over time as users interact with it. Because we have to worry about our cache data getting stale, we have to come up with solutions to correctly invalidate that cache when it's appropriate to do so. However, caching can be very helpful for raw computation as well. A classic example of this is the Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence is a mathematical sequence where the first two numbers of the sequence are one, and then every subsequent number is equal to the prior two numbers of the sequence combined. So our third number here is going to be two. Our fourth number here is going to be three. And then our fifth number here is going to be two plus three, which is five. And then after that comes three plus five, which is eight. And then 13, and then 21, and then 34, and etc. If we take a look at some code for how we could represent this sequence, we can actually represent it via this function. So in this function, we're taking in a parameter, and this number represents the targeted index of the Fibonacci sequence that we want to find. So for example, if we want to find the answer at index zero, the answer will be one. If we want to find the answer at index one, the answer is one as well. However, if we want to find the answer for a higher number, what we'll do is we'll recursively call the Fibonacci sequence for the prior two numbers, add them together, and that will give us our answer. Let's run this code and see how it works. I'll start with the first number, and then the second number, and then the third number, and the fourth number, and you'll notice as we keep running this with higher and higher numbers, our number of computations is actually starting to grow exponentially. We'll see by the time we run this with 40, it actually took my computer a while to figure out. And the reason why is because we ended up having to recurse over 300 million times. Notice if I try to run this with 50, my computer just freezes. I'm just gonna cancel that before uh, my computer takes off here. Here's a little visualization of why that got so complex so quickly. Zero we can immediately figure out is one. One we can immediately figure out is one as well. And then for two, we're going to compute the answers for zero and one again. And three, we're going to compute the answers for one and two. And then as this keeps going, the size of the tree here is representative of the total amount of computation we'll have to perform in order to get our answer. And already by the time we get to seven, I don't wanna to have to copy and paste this list again. <laughs> so I'm not going to. But if we come back to the beginning, we can actually see how caching could potentially help speed this up. For example, when we're computing our answer to three, we're actually computing the answer for two again. So instead of recomputing the answer, we can instead cache our answer for two. And then when it's time to recompute two in order to calculate our answer for three, we can just point our answer to the cache. So one plus our two is three. Same thing for computing four. So computing the answer for two, we can just point this to our cached result for two. And then for computing the answer for three, we can just point this instead to our answer for three. And then two plus three equals five. 
we can see the amount of computations we actually have to perform here are drastically reducing. So let's adjust our JavaScript code now to match the algorithm that we had just described in the visualization. I'm going to add a cache here that's just an object literal that we're going to use as a hash map. And we're going to use this object to store all of our answers. And now we're going to adjust the implementation of our function to add a check here at the start to say that if we have a cached result for the parameter that we're given, we're simply going to return that answer instead of doing unnecessary computation. If the answer for our given parameter is not cached, then we'll run the same computation as we had done before. But then right before returning, we're going to store that result into the cache at the correct index. And this is our way of warming or populating our cache. And now if I hit a save and we open up our terminal and we run this Fibonacci sequence on 50, we can see that this completes almost instantly. Now in this situation, our Fibonacci function is a pure function. The answer for the 50th Fibonacci number is always going to be this ungodly large number. However, you'll notice that we did end up recursing 99 nine times in order to get our answer. And this is because we're starting with a fresh or cold cache each time. If we wanted to, before ending our process, we could actually store the contents of this cache to disk and then read in the contents of our disk into our cache when we started up our process. Very similarly, we could also add in a network request here to store our answer to some external system or API that's going to maintain our cache for us. And this has the benefit of also being able to share the computation work that we've done with other computers. Because this Fibonacci is a pure function, it really doesn't matter where we end up computing that answer. It'll always be the same. And this is actually true for any pure function. Any computation where we can say, given some set of inputs, we can always expect an exact output, then we should be clear to have a local cache on our disk or a distributed cache across a network request or an API call. And this leads us to our final example of caching, which is NX. I'm actually using NX inside of our to-do application that we saw earlier. So here I can open up a terminal and I can use NX as a task runner to run a build on my to-do application. And the way NX works, it has caching built into its task running. So when I hit enter here, we can see that NX read the output from the cache instead of running the command for all of the tasks that it had to run in order to complete the build. Now in this case in particular, I actually did have the build for our to-do cached on my local machine. I only had it cached on NX Cloud. But because I was connected to NX Cloud, I was able to take advantage of the fact that someone else had run a build using the same exact source code. And so I was able to just pull down the outputs which is really cool if you think about it. Essentially, we've turned any kind of cacheable operation into a pure function, where the inputs of that function are your actual source code plus the actual source code of any of the dependencies inside of your node modules. And this way, running our build looks kind of like running that Fibonacci function. We always knew that the answer to Fibonacci of 50 was that really big number. And we always know that this source code is going to produce this specific artifact. It's really just that simple. So that was four different yet very connected examples of caching in the real world. I really hope you enjoyed this video. It was a blast for me to put together. If you liked it or you want to find out more about NX in particular, be sure to check out other videos on our channel, especially our video on the NX iceberg that we released recently that really goes into the full value of NX that gets unlocked once you uncover all of the deeper cool features hidden inside of NX. Until next time, y'all keep working hard. And we'll see y'all next time. Peace.